TCP stack. And the UDP stack is mostly the same thing. And the problem is that for um, when receiving packets, stuff disappears into here. It's a great big thing. But there's no guarantee that it's actually going to run on the same CPU as the data that's coming down this way. So this diagram looks very neat. And so when traffic's being sent this way and packets are being received this way, this looks like it all lines up. But what actually goes on in the middle here is all like this. Oh, wow. Right? And so unfortunately, since there's, um, there's no real enforced affinity between uh, what CPU you're doing work on and what queue the traffic is appearing on the NIC. And because there was only one great big um, uh, uh, TCP and UDP state table inside the kernel for uh, storing all the information about current connections c uh, protected by one lock, there's massive lock contention that occurs when you start turning this on for machines with say, 140 CPUs. Wow. And it's been like this forever. And um, Microsoft came up with this neat solution a few years ago, which uh, they, they then uh, <coughs> asked the hardware manufacturers really nicely to implement, <laughs> where um, the NIC actually hash it, takes the packet coming in and hashes it with a, uh, with a some, some kind of hash. I don't want to say the name because I always get it wrong. And then um, that, that, hash is, uh, uh, that hash is done on the packet header, so it maps any given particular TCP or UDP connection gets mapped to one CPU, and then they actually, in the kernel, line all this crap up. So in fact, what actually happens inside Windows is for the first N CPUs in your machine, that all lines up. And even if you have 140 CPUs in a machine, if your NIC only supports eight queues, then you only have the first eight CPUs in your machine with all of this neatly lined up. And in the Microsoft world, they said, okay, when you write network applications, you know, you, you know that this is what's going on, and if you want to take advantage of, say, the other 130, uh, 32 CPUs in the machine, that's a user space problem. But when you want to actually write stuff out to the network socket, if you do, if you line this up correctly, then there'll be no lock contention in the middle here. And the second half of it is that, um, with some work done earlier on, uh, a few years ago, by Robert Watson, he, he implemented, sorry? He implemented something called PCB groups, where, uh, instead of there being one big table in the middle here, he actually broke it up so that there's actually now one separate table for each CPU. And then there's a great big other table that it uses to, uh, to fall back on, but there's one lock for each of these tables. And so if everything's all lined up correctly and you've written your software correctly, there's almost no lock contention anymore between the top half and the bottom half of the stack because all the stuff that's going on this way and all the stuff that's going on this way always all runs on the same CPU. And so the only locking that's going on is between the two halves. And the only time that there's any lock intention is when something really dumb happens, like you go and grab the lock to transmit and then you get an interrupt which wants to grab the lock to handle the interrupt and you very quickly can't do that. But that's the only lock intention that's left. And I test this on four and eight core machines and there is no network stack lock intention anymore when this is all lined up correctly. So all of this has uh, hit the tree about... Um, so Robert's stuff hit the tree about uh, six months ago, and I implemented all the user space side of this so you could actually write a web server that can use this about, well, sometime late last night. <laughs> um, so this is all now, that all works very well. It only works up until like eight CPUs because the, the cheap ass Intel 10 gigabit and 20 gigabit card only has eight queues. If you buy a Chelsea NIC, then you can do this for as many queues as the Chelsea NIC supports, like 128 if you really wanted to. Um, so that all now works. Now it's, it's, it's different to what Linux does, but um, in this way I can actually um, predict exactly what CPU my stuff's going to be on. So if someone's writing a UDP or a TCP uh, server, like a web server or a FreeBSD, and you want to make it run a bit faster, come and see me. Um, the thing that makes this a pain in the ass is that uh, you've got to figure out a way to get a particular tr uh, a connection coming in, say a TCP connection, to arrive at the right CPU because traditionally when you write a web, uh, like a UDP or a TCP server, you have one listen socket which then handles all your connections and traditionally you'll either have one thread sitting on say this CPU that takes all the connections in and then throws work on all the other CPUs or you simply have one listen socket in each thing um, 
or uh, sorry, the same listen socket bound to, uh, in, in, in multiple threads and hope one of the threads gets woken up to win. And all of these scenarios all really suck. And so what I actually implemented that makes this work is I added some support so you can have multiple listen sockets. And so you can create listen sockets in each of these CPUs. And then what you say to the kernel is, I'm actually in this bucket, or I'm in this bucket. And then all the subsequent connections coming in that come in on this NIC queue, that on this <coughs> CPU in this stack, end up at that socket. So you actually have create eight or 16 or 32 incoming sockets. And the kernel makes sure that all the crap goes up to that socket correctly. And I know this was a, a bit of a, a point of contention at, at, uh, at EuroBSDCon last year, but the nice side effect of doing it this way is I don't have any contention in the fault script code anymore. Because these are all individual sockets and they're all individual file descriptors. So the only contention in the file descriptor code is when you're creating and destroying file descriptors, which is a standard problem anyway. But there's no other lock contention in terms of trying to have multiple threads accepting or doing crap with the same file descriptor and multiple threads. All of that goes away as well. So this is all in FreeBSD head now. Um, I'm going to make it work for UDP and then TCP uh, and then IPv6 probably September time frame at this point but this should all hit FreeBSD 11. So now what I'm looking for is people who want to write TCP and UDP services or want to do something dirty like update mempage to use this to, to ping me because I'd actually like to start having things, yeah, I'd actually start to like to start having things use this rather than just sitting there by itself doing nothing. C, Paul, VC. DNS would be benefit if you're trying yes. to do ridiculous amounts of UDP. About it for years. Yeah. So the idea is that when, when the UDP side is done, you create one UDP listen socket for each of them, <coughs> and then whenever a request comes in, as long as the reply is going to the same uh, source destination port and address, it'll hash to the same value. So you just write it back out to this socket, and it will just come back down this path. And there'll be no lock contention for as many CPUs as your NIC supports. Yeah. And that's my talk. Any questions? Yeah, several. Uh, the, first, <laughs> the first with the Antelnic, what does happen when you go over eight? It doesn't support it. When you turn on RSS, it only supports eight. Right, so what, what, do, we have, what do we do? Do we... Nothing. Get a Chelsea up. <laughs> I only create, you only create up to eight queues. And so it only, only eight queues get created on the system for any NIC. It doesn't, it doesn't you, more. you will have a whole bunch of crosses. <clears throat> no, there won't be. Well, at the moment you will, because there's no, unless you do all of this little legwork, it will. But right. if you line all this up and you have like a 128 core machine, mm -hmm. only the first eight cores are going to get network traffic. And then if you send packets from any other cores, yes, they'll end up locking those queues. So as the Microsoft model is that, that's a user land problem to come up with some kind of queuing model in user land to, like, a, like say, a lock, some kind of lockless queue to push multiple CPUs sending data into one CPU that's doing all the I.O. and then that CPU does all the network I.O. Are you assuming here that you've uh, locked each process to a CPU? Yes. Okay. Because the, rec the receive side, so the other part of this is that the receive side and the T all the TCP call, uh, like timer shit all stays on that CPU as well. So you don't have the fun thing of you're doing transmit and receive, but the timer for your connection is running over here. Because that also screws things up. So you've locked your server on the first eight and your shell can run on the other core. Yeah. yeah. And your editor or whatever. Yeah. Any other questions? And so you, if you're doing that, if you've got multiple queues, then haven't you pushed the locking problem back into your app now that you can have multiple sockets trying to rally into the buffers of whatever processing you're doing? So the, um, it all depends on the architecture of your network service, right? I mean, if it's a web server and you, you and it's, an, it's all incoming stuff, then you'll only ever get sockets on this CPU that come in this NIC queue, right? So you won't have the problem of having, unless your web service wants to write stuff out to other, to other connections, like say it's a web proxy, then it'll all stay on that CPU. You know now, what I'm saying if it's data that each uh, thread needs to share or something. Right, but again, that's a user land problem. We have the same problem, you have the same problem regardless now. Of it, it, regardless of the kind of application you write. And right. I mean, the, the, the argument of whether you want to have the kernel or user land do that is a separate argument, right? And your point of view on that is? Sorry? Your point of view on that. Application dependent. I mean, the problem right now, that I, what the thing I saw at Netflix when I was pushing this at 40 plus gig is the VM locks fuck you. Like, the way that we pay, lock VM pages is pretty terrifying. Um, and we don't actually have one page per lock. There's a small pool of locks that the VM address gets hashed to. And so you end up 
contending on that regardless of what you do. So if you try sharing data, you actually end up having multiple CPUs having to grab the VM lock for that page, which is also contending with whatever else hashes to that, to that lock. So it becomes pretty terrifying pretty quickly. Now in fact, it's working on that. So, uh, not, I may have my arm twisted to do this like next year. I mean, I'm, I work, this isn't work related, this is fun related. Um, but the thing is that no one's really pushed a box to 40 gig with ridiculous numbers of connections. So all the testing people do with like 40 and 80 gig is like the minimum number of TCP connections or UDP service uh, sessions required to prove that your NIC can push that much data. Define ridiculous. <clears throat> like one. I mean, Chelsea can do it on one with, t with, with uh, transmit offload, but like a handful, 16, 32, 64. When you want to scale to like a half, half a million connections on a box, there's, um, you, you, it's, a different set of, it's a different kind of locking problem, a different kind of concurrency problem. And so that's what this, this sort of thing is trying to, trying to um, address. So say I'm writing a service uh, or any server in user space. Right. And I have a software. Yes. How do I know which thing you block it? Uh, for incoming or outgoing? Uh, I so outgoing I haven't solved yet. Okay. The way I've done it with outgoing is that you create the connection, but you don't know up front what the port is unless you assign it yourself and do the hashing yourself. And then you, once, you've, once, you've sent some once you've done some traffic or the port's been assigned, you can ask the kernel, hey, what, what bucket are you in? For incoming, it gets already put in the queue for the socket already. Like you have one accept socket in each, then when you call accept on the one in here, you're going to get sockets only for the CPU. And the same for any other CPU. So as long as you don't want to share that socket that you've just accepted with any other thread, and it just stays on that thread, like say memcached or, web, or straight web services, then you don't, you don't actually have to think about that anymore. Because it's going to be CPU local and it stays CPU local. But you can actually have a, there's, there's an API now you can query, what CPU am I supposed to be on, which bucket am I supposed to, which RSS bucket am I supposed to be in? And then that way, then you can you can know for certain whether you, it's in the right spot or not. Would it, would it be possible to make a scheduler a little smart enough to actually wait the CPU that the program runs on, so that the uh, application has to do nothing to benefit from this? So no, because the problem is that the scheduler has no idea about the state of the network stack or what it's actually sent to it. So the Dragonfly BSD guys did the same thing, which is. They assumed the scheduler would keep a thread on a CPU and never schedule it anywhere else. <laughs> and then once that's the case, all the traffic that's getting hashed coming in here goes to whatever uh, thread is running local on that CPU. The minute the scheduler has to de decide for whatever reason to migrate it somewhere else yeah. for a while, and it accumulates some sockets from the wrong queue and then goes back again, either of those cases suck. Yeah. Right? And so I thought about it and I'm like, no, you know what? It's about time people who wrote Unix networking code wrote clean Unix networking code rather than just like smashing some shit together from Stephen's book on writing network applications, <laughs> which is a good book, but it assumes you have a single core machine, right? And so this is where the Windows people have excelled. Like the Windows where you write network services is you have a pool of I.O. threads doing your I.O., which is this, and then you have a pool of application threads hanging off doing other crap elsewhere, and your a pool of I.O. threads never is never supposed to do any application logic, and it's never supposed to block. And that scales ridiculously well in the, in the Windows world, and the Unix world hates it, okay. right? But that, that seems to work quite well in the, for everyone who's not running Unix. So I, saw, I thought, bugger it. We may as well give that a shot. Cool. So there's no like round robin or anything for distribution? No. Well, because the, 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 we're, we're stuck on what the NIC gives us, and the NIC is, is, uh, is, is hashing the packets for us to take a given flow, TCP or UDP flow, into one of its queues. The NIC isn't doing round robin. And for uh, someone's approached me to, to who wants to implement the software version of this. So if your NIC only has one queue, but you want to be able to still take advantage of this, then you have the receive packet come in and then you hash it in software and then you dump it in one of these queues. And so there's still no lock contention in the, in the receive path. Well, that, all, all that's the theory. But like these days, for like 10 gig and 40 gig NICs, they all have multiple queues, so no one cares. It's only for people who want to do weird shit on like gigabit Ethernet, four core ARM or MIPS boards. That, that can't hash in hardware. Yeah. So, so we're hashing all of these packets, right? Uh, all other things remaining equal, what sort of impact would that have on my application's performance? What do you mean? Well, we're not doing any hashing in software, so no. OK, then. All right. <laughs> so this is purely IO, it's, um, and then you have application threads uh, behind it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm not trying to solve the world here. What I'm trying to do is get rid of the dumb lock contention that's in the network stack and take advantage of all the, the work that other people did that you couldn't actually use. So, um, 
Like how, how it, when someone does this to memcached, however somebody wants to lock memcached or do whatever, how they want to do to have you know, consistent updates from all the threads where people could be writing updates or purging shit from some local, central, like large in-memory database, that's their problem. I can't fix this here. And whether they want to replicate stuff, use mutexes or atomics or lockless crap, that's, that's a user land problem. This just solves the IO, the network IO part. It didn't even solve in the disk IO part. That's a, that's a completely different screwed up kettle of fish. <laughs> is that kettle of fish in your... Nope. OK. Because the problem with disk IO is that uh, up until very, very recently, none of the, the controllers may do uh, may handle multiple submissioning and completion IO queues, but the drivers don't take advantage of it in any way. And so, um, and, and, and the kernel itself, because of all the caching going on, all the, all the page caching going on, um, we also have to find ways to mitigate the cost of having the VM page cache locks be so shitty, right? Yeah. And so, yes, we could, we could do the same kind of thing for doing disk traffic, but I don't want to wrap my head around that. I already have enough shit of work to do. That, th disk traffic is just drivers and cam is a completely different screwed up set setup. Yeah. Well, in GM, is that the biggest problem that would prevent this? Right? Well, I mean, th I'm not. Uh, yeah, GM's but our GM is so single. -threaded. No, so GM isn't single threaded anymore in head. Like uh, Moby fixed that a year ago, mm -hmm. and so um, it's all done direct dispatch completion now. And so I could, we could get a few hundred thousand ops out of the disk. Uh, last year, out of, a, out of a bunch of disks last year, uh, last year, and I think he's improved on that. So no, the, the G up and G down shit in, in head, and I think in 10 is dead. We don't have to worry about that anymore. But it's still a single queue coming off the, off the um, SCSI controller, right? It's still a single, in, single submission queue, single, single disk, uh, completion queue. And there's half a dozen queues in Geom, sorry, in, um, in CAM, but they're not hashed on CPU or anything. And, and, and Alex actually committed some stuff to the NFS server to start creating a pool of stuff protected by a mutex per, per uh, queue, specifically to start undoing some of the dumb performance issues that they saw in NFS. But can you just define CAM? Uh, it's the disk, like, it's the... Oh, yeah. Common access. That one. It's what, it's what FreeBSD uses for queuing and dequeuing, uh, queuing and completing disk I.O. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Cool. If anyone has any spare Chelsea or hardware, let me know. Because <laughs> I... <laughs> I wonder. So, uh, we just donated uh, half a dozen cards to the PBS2 Foundation. Mm -hmm. This was after BS2 Canada. Mm -hmm. It was just last month or so. So, uh, I want this to you all. Yeah, yeah. I know it's a bit of a pain to use them, but the hardware is... I'll good. see if I can. I have this thing about keeping it under my desk in my apartment, uh -huh. which is why this got finished. Mainly because... Um, mm -hmm. All of the new stuff in the cluster, people really want, everyone wants to use the new, right. the new boxes in the cluster with the T5 NICs in them. Mm -hmm. And so I actually got a lot more done having two boxes under my desk connected by crossover than, mm -hmm. than trying to use the existing crap in the, uh, in the foundation stuff. Mainly because when I crash things, I can like put on a t-shirt, walk into my study room and press the button. Which is convenient. So add uh, 10 and 40 gig rate, uh -huh. if you have uh, just a handful of connections that are pushing most of the traffic, mm -hmm. Uh, especially if they are receiving it, you run into trouble with this model. Yeah, absolutely. It's not going to scale for that. It'll yes. only scale for like large numbers of connections. Yes, yes. Exactly. So just about the foundation cluster, just, there, there's no IP mining campaign? It's, incon no? it's inconsistently implemented. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, it's the IPMI and the and the power, like the remote power strip, they're both inconsistently implemented. And maybe the new boxes suck much less. But I tried using some of this crap a couple like a month ago when I was looking at doing this. And that's why I said fuck it and spend money on a box under my desk at home because there's plenty of hardware, but a lot, especially a lot of the older stuff that has some 10 gig cards in it, it's all it can be inconsistently connected up. If it's under your desk, is it far 64? No. <laughs> in fact, in fact, I found Indian problems in the Intel driver that I refuse to fix whilst doing this. So this won't work on Spark 64 and Intel Next. So, yes. What, what do the T5 cards have? What do you mean? Like compared to the T4s? They're faster? I actually, so on Netflix, I did this with, with, uh, with two, uh, quad 10 gig T5s and got 40 gig on 100,000 sockets. 100,000? Yeah, on, 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 a, on a, like an A core Sandy Bridge box. Could do 40 gig like line rate. I couldn't put, I got like 37.5 gig and then the, and then the card couldn't take any more packets. Transmitting and receive? Or? Just transmitting. It was receiving acts. 
processing app to Windows DI. It was 100,000 concurrent sockets. And it was extremely delicate because it uh, um, turns out the number one problem for me after I fixed all the other VM shit was TCP output and like cache misses in TCP output. So if, if the, and this is going into weird trivia, if the, if the um, offload, if the, the, if the M buffs that you're passing to the TCP output path drop below like 32K, if, they start, if it starts leaking out 1500 bytes at a time to the TCP path, everything falls over. Just shrug. So. But yeah, the T5 stuff works really well, I have to say, cool. with this. I just don't have any, I don't have T5 hardware on me to do this with. But uh, it should work fine. All the hardware supports that. Yo. I have an API question. Sure. When accept returns a new socket uh -huh. descriptor, what do you do with that? Do you give that to, <coughs> how do you figure out which thread to give it oh, to? Oh, okay, so the way it works is that the, um, I was worried that that was going to be a pain in the ass in the kernel to do. And it turns out that um, there's a PCB, that, like in the standard model, there's one great big PCB table that has all the PCB entries. And so your socket has a, has a wildcard entry in the PCB table, which, which then when you, pack an incoming connection, incoming TCP connection or UDP packet comes in, it does a wildcard lookup in the PCB table to say, hey, is there a socket that matches source address and source port zero, destination address, my local machine and my local port, and it's marked as listen, right? And if it finds that entry in the, in, the, in the global table, then that socket wins that, 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 that connection, right? In the PCB groups model, there's one PCB table per CPU or per bucket in my setup, but then there's also a global wildcard, PCB wildcard table that the in incoming sockets sit on so that you only have to do one lookup when you have an incoming connection coming in, right? However, for this model, what I said was I said, okay, when you create an, an accept socket and you put it in this CPU, instead of it sticking the, 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 uh, the socket in the global PCB table that uh, everything matches on, it sticks it in this specific CPU's PCB table. So when an incoming connection comes in, the first thing I do is I go, is it a packet for something I already know about? No. Is it a wildcard match in this CPU's local PCB table? And if the answer is yes, it will be because it matches. It then dumps that, that embryonic connection to that particular socket. And then I, I, that was like, it, all I had to do there was just add a 20 lines of code to walk the, the PCB group's table for wildcard sockets. Right, and then all of the other machinery fell into place. The connection will arrive on this particular socket's connect on this particular socket's accept queue, and then a new connection gets connect created that way, and everything works. On. I didn't have to dig around any further than that. So you have multiple listening sockets yeah. on each CPU. Yeah. And if you don't, let's say you only have it on. So if, the I, first if I did three, this, yeah. Right, and only have this one, this one, and this one, then any connections that come in here get get RST. Because there's nothing, there's no, if I, I, unless I create a global socket that I have it bound to a CPU, if I just create ones per CPU and I don't create this one, then yeah, I'll end up, there won't be anything that matches at any of the local PCP tables, and there won't be one that matches the global PCP table, and so as far as this IP stack's concerned, there's nothing, there's no PCP entry matching that, and it just treats the connection as the port is not, is not bound to. So it's an RST or it's ignored, depending upon what you do. So now, does the application need to be aware of how many queues? Mm -hmm. And there's does? an API. I, I added a SysCTL API, and I'm going to write, add a little library that you call to say how many how many queues are there? What's the CPU to queue mapping, right? And then, then later on, there'll be some dev D hook that says, oh, by the way, we need to you know go and change the mapping because one of the CPUs has too much traffic compared to the others, and we want to rebalance the the distribution between buckets and CPUs, right? And then we can tell all the applications that are currently using this, hey, by the way. You know, you don't have to move any of your sockets around, but just move your worker threads to different CPUs now in order to rebalance stuff. So, is this, so do you need a new API to actually uh, create these sockets on the first CPU base? Yep. Okay. I, mean, I mean, so you call socket, and then you do two, you do two set sockets to say you can bind to multiple entries and multiple PCB entries, and this is your RSS bucket, and then you call bind, okay. and then you call listen. Yeah. yeah. And I promise I'll write documentation for this soon. Oh yes, I'm actually I'm actually I emailed Doc and asked them for help, so I'm actually doing documentation for it. Who's helping? Uh, uh, Warren. So yeah, this is cool. Um, the the tricky bit is going to be doing. I know this talk's been going on a lot too long. So the tricky bit is later on we're going to have. Uh, this pen sucks. Let's try again. So later on, say we have a four socket machine. Right, that has the standard, what the fuck is going on here. And 
say we actually have like one NIC here and one NIC here, and these are eight core CPUs and these are 40 gig NICs. And what we want to do is make sure that we not only bind the NIC yes. to a local CPU core yes. but, and all the connections to that local CPU core, but we don't, we have like this for this and this for this, or however else you want to break it up. But you don't want to have the current scenario where the drivers know nothing about the CPU topology and they just start blindly creating worker threads on the starting at CPU zero, hoping that that's optimal for the bus topology. So the, the next bit is teaching the, uh, is, is teaching the bus layer about uh, enough topology to make this make sense and then be able to create different one RSS group per NIC in order to be able to keep traffic for a particular NIC on a particular set of CPU cores so that we can have effectively, you know, if, if everything is in memory, then the only traffic going across the QPI or whatever, or hypertransport is memory, like database lookups going to other CPUs, but all of the kernel state, all the M buffs, all the PCB lookups, all the VM shit is all kept local to this particular pair of CPU and, the, and their memory. Because otherwise, at the moment, if you tried running like a, a massively parallel test on a dual core or a dual socket or <coughs> one socket box, the box starts to fall over because there's so much traffic going on between all the sockets that it actually can sometimes perform worse mm -hmm. than if you just had a single socket box with two NICs in it, which is really dumb, but that's the price you pay for hardware. So that's next year's, that's next year's fun task, making that work. I, I recall that uh, when I was at IX, there were um, certain slots in the motherboard mm -hmm. that would associate with the CPU, and you want to put the NIC card in that right mm -hmm. slot to get some bridge or something. That it all depends on what the motherboard manufacturer decided to do and how they wired up the slots. I, I talked to Doug about it when I was there last because I wanted to know what the topology of these things were. I mean, if ideally you'd have a box like this where you have one like 40 gig NIC or 80 gig NIC hanging off yeah. each CPU socket yeah. and maybe keep everything local, yeah. right? So that the, the memory, the NIC and the memory and the CPU socket are local and the only crap going between CPUs is like database lookups, yeah. right? But all the, all the sessions stay, stays local. And that, that would be fun, like. Anyone's able to do that? Huh? You're not able to see that. Uh, so from what I've been told, the smaller boxes no because of spacing issues, but apparently some of the really expensive boxes will do that. Well, it's more a lot of folks want to be able to grow, so start off with two processors and you don't want to have half your IO slots not working. Correct. Correct. That's why you tend so, to I, so I'm ignoring that until like all right, like UDP and TCP and, and, and IPv6 and UDP is done, and then I need I've started speaking to Baldwin and John Baldwin about what we'd have to do to teach. Um, new bus have, uh, have new bus grow some methods where it can detect and store bus topology. And this discussion has been going on in FreeBSD for a decade yeah, and a yeah, half, yeah. right? I mean, this isn't a new discussion to have. It's just about fucking time we had it. So, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, and we need to do it regardless of like, not just for me. We need to do this for other stuff as well. Like, there's no point in putting necessarily point in putting worker threads for my storage cards if they're hanging off a socket. Why would I put those? Why would I let those things run on another CPU socket? I mean, that just seems really dumb. And if you have a box with like two NICs and four HBAs and the threads are running on whatever fucking CPU seems free and the kernel can just decide at any point in time, oh, oh, I got interrupted in this currently running thread, but I can reschedule that thread immediately in another CPU socket at will. There's no, it doesn't do any kind of real useful uh, uh, affinity for kernel threads. So that, that needs to happen regardless of this. So I just want to have it happen now. It makes my life easier. Yo. Site discussion semi related to this virtualized hardware. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen a lot of hypervisors present, you know, hardware looks like this. You mm -hmm. might say it tells it it looks like that because it wants to not have more than four cores per socket, mm -hmm. let's say. Um, and so our scheduler and everything else starts trying to optimize for this. But you know, in reality, when your hypervisor gave you 16 or 32 cores, mm -hmm. so it's going to get mapped all over the place. We don't have APIs to tell the scheduler or anything else. The, the topology you learn, screw it. Flatten it all out and optimize. All we have is CPU sets. And CPU sets it can be useful for this because you can, if you know your VM is going to be using the virtualized IO path for, say, the Intel NIC, and you allocate a bunch of queues from that, and that's 
all been talked about and implemented. No, else you for scheduling and everything. Oh, sure, sure. But, you, but yeah, I mean, the only thing you have is CPU set. So I dicked around with this at work yeah. uh, on a desktop machine because um, I noticed that the a two-core uh, PCBSD VM was being scheduled because it's all done in kernel threads. The kernel threads were pinging all over the place, right? And when I locked it down to, to four CPUs instead of all 16 threads, it was only four threads, the, the guy's VM got a 20% boost because suddenly the fucking kernel threads that are running the, the virtual box stuff are being migrated all over the place like a schizophrenic child. And so, I shouldn't say that, that's actually insensitive. Like <laughs> something, some kid on like, like Red Cordial. And so, um, yeah, we don't actually have that awareness at the moment. And that would be nice. The other half of that is when, when we do have more like PCI pass through and the virtualized uh, Intel NICs, it's probably gonna be a good idea once we expose like which NIC queues or uh, whatever get, and um, what, what traffic for what VM gets mapped to which subset of queues and which CPUs those queues run on that the VMs also run on those CPUs. And so you don't have the problem of having a, a machine with a couple of hundred VMs with the underlying NIC stuff or the virtualized plumbing working, but there being no <coughs> affinity. And it's constantly hitting lock contention when doing transmit and receive handling because of that. So that also has to happen, but that's, as I said, yeah, we need to get affinity, we need, sorry, we need to get topology awareness in the bus code first, in UBUS first, so that devices can plumb this shit. And then the, whatever virtualization APIs we need to grow on the kernel to let VirtualBox and other things say, hey, I'd like to peel off a TX and RX ring for this VM matching this particular thing. Can you please run this queues NIC handler on, uh, can you please tell me what, what pass through CPU this thing's on so I can pin my virtualization my VM to that particular small subset of CPU so it's not running all over the place. Pardon.